Okay, um, we're going to have a few minutes in a moment just to take some initial questions if you have any. Um, we're just running, I think we're about 10 minutes behind, so we're not doing too badly. Before I do that, however, um, we may have sparked your interest now in terms of, oh, there might be something in here for me and my organisation and the partnership that I'm looking to work with. Um, myself and Brenda are obviously coming at it from the point of view of the kind of application management, um, coordination, project delivery side. So we're going to be actively engaged in the assessment of project applications as and when they come to us, which leaves it a little bit difficult sometimes. We've got a, a fine line and a balance point there to strike in terms of guiding applicants. We can't really get involved in project deliver, uh, development activity um, because we need to maintain that degree of independence, but we're obviously very happy to guide in terms of what we could identify as being key issues um, that a project application may present. However, right in front of myself here, um, we have a lady, if she would get up and turn around and let you see her face, who can actually help and work with you on project development. And this is Caroline Coleman who is based in Scotland, but she's able to work with you regardless of where you are within the eligible region. And Caroline is our Scottish National Contact Point for the Interreg programme, and she's available to guide, assist, and help in terms of project development um, type activity and work that you're doing. And you'll be able to access Caroline and I think her contact details, if they're not in the packs, we'll certainly make those available um, later. They should be on our website anyway. But Caroline is floating around, so if you want to ask questions, you want to uh, get a little bit of additional support and guidance, um, no better place to start and obviously Brenda and I will be happy to complement that um, opportunity as best we can. Maybe if we take 10 minutes now though and just if there are any immediate burning questions that you have um, and I will do my best to try and respond to those. Yes? Hi Louise. Maybe just say who you are, where you're from and just what your question. Sure, uh, John Bartlett from IT Sago. Uh, There's actually two questions if that's okay. Okay. Uh, the first question is, you, you've mentioned a, a list, which is in the work program, obviously, of, of existing thematic service delivery areas in which the targets, are, to which the targets are tied. You've also mentioned two uh, potential cross-cutting approaches, uh, information technology and, and uh, I can't remember the other one now, training. Um, is there room, uh, you've also, as, and the other speaker also mentioned the need for innovation and particularly welcoming a, a, a potentially transformational approach to innovation within the sector. Is there room for an alternative cross-cutting approach, uh, cross-cutting uh, proposal that might impact on some or all of the uh, existing thematic service delivery areas? Or is it exclusively um, set out and that's it? That's, that's the first question. Second question is, um, there's a suggestion in some of the other teams emerging in very recent times that um, the agencies expect pretty much one super application covering all targets, um, which is essentially service delivery. Is that the expectation in health also? Okay. Okay, maybe take the second question first, if that's okay. Um, from a uh, managing a sort of authority perspective and, and within SUPB, we are tasked with the responsibility by the European Commission to obviously go out there to invite applications and to make sure that we have a robust assessment process which demonstrates equality, fairness, transparency in terms of how we assess application. Now we're obviously looking at applications and project proposals that have a, a, an opportunity and a potential to have regional impact and significance. Therefore, they need to be of a scale by which there is a demonstrable impact as a result of the delivery. But we are not requiring one application. We are looking for proposals which can demonstrate that they can deliver the outputs that are required. Now, we may get applications which span more than one of the areas that we've talked through and identified today. We will assess your project proposal you know, when it comes through to us in terms of what it is that you're presenting to do. Um, but we have to make sure, and one of the ways that the Commission asks us to demonstrate value for money is that we can demonstrate that there has been a degree of competition, that we've had applications that have come forward which have presented proposals and where we've been able to form a judgment as to the quality of service, the cost of the services that are being provided, and we can demonstrate that the, uh, the proposal that we've selected represents a value for money um, delivery of the programme and achieving the outputs. So 
In terms of how we break this down, we're still in conversation with our departmental colleagues in terms of how we can best identify a threshold kind of scale in some way. It's very difficult until we know roughly what the proposals, what the ideas are. It's very difficult. We don't want to rule things out. We don't want to you know, be very arbitrary in a way that is not appropriate for the applicant, but we do need to put in some threshold limits in terms of what is the minimum requirement by, for, for an application to demonstrate uh, for you to be able to get through the, the process. We're still in conversation about that at the moment. We are at an advanced stage on it, however, and we will have that defined at the point at which the call goes live at the beginning of October. So it does not have to be one application covering everything, but we are aware that there will be organisations out there who will want to apply for a range of service areas and who will come in with coordinated approaches. That will come down to the assessment process then in terms of how the steering committee um, review those proposals and form a judgment in terms of its relative merits against the criteria that Brenda will relay to you after the coffee break. Does that? The first question in terms of, well, the cross-cutting applications in terms of themes, is your question more related in terms of more than one area, for example, mental health service and positive um, health, different approaches? We're happy to take, I mean, if you have a proposal which demonstrates innovation and demonstrates quality, you present it. We're, Brenda will explain to you the criteria which we'll be looking at. One of those is quality of project design. There are many ways in which you can demonstrate quality of project design and delivery. So if you've got something there which is new, innovative, represents best practice and takes us in a new direction, that could be the thing that makes your project stand out in that regard. Okay, hi. Brian Smith here from the Social Farming Project. It's uh, providing service to people with disabilities and mental health and in community setting in rural areas. But just wondering, is there indicative budgetary allocations on the nine? We're or going to go through that after the oh, coffee okay, break. Yeah. So that there is. Yeah. Now, again, just to reference, and Brenda will explain this to you, they are indicative. It was just at the point at which the cooperation program was being discussed with the commission. They wanted some indicative budget figures. So there were some figures which were developed. They are indicative. They are not hard and fast. So we may find that there is some movement between those in terms of making it entirely appropriate to the delivery of the particular area of work. Okay. Sorry, Lorraine. It's just Hi. Audrey here. Audrey. Um, just going back to IT Sligo, I suppose um, I'm not quite sure what angle you were coming from on your first question, but I suppose the thing is, what I mentioned earlier is that the operational programme, and that's why I encourage people to look at it, is the final document, everything else falls from that. So if it's not you know, within that, if you like, or within, within the parameters outlined in the operational programme, it can't be deemed eligible. I'm happy to pick it up over the coffee break, okay? Um, Hi. Hi, Mary Lynch, um, Learning Disability Organisation, something special in Derry, London Derry. Um, my question is, uh, we have been successful in getting European funding under the ESF okay. programme. And one of the difficulties that we found was the match funding, because under ESF, they were unwilling okay. to take in kind funding. Yes. So the organisation had to put up some funds themselves. Is that going to be the case with this one? No, in kind contributions can be considered. But what we will need you to do is we need you to define what the contribution is. So for sake of argument, if it is staff time, for sake of argument, we would ask you to define what grade of staff, how many hours. And there will need to be a mechanism for tracking that to make sure that it's definitely delivered to the project. Um, we would obviously need to understand that the level, the type of work that's being done in terms of that contribution in kind, that it's at an appropriate level in terms of the, just the monetary value apportioned to it. So it's just the scale in terms of who's coming in to do. And if you were, for example, providing access to facilities in terms of you know, buildings, um, equipment and so on, again, we would look at, well, what are you providing? What is the market relevant value of providing that which would otherwise have to be bought into the project? And therefore that's a, a, a contribution. But we just need, as we go through the delivery of the project, we will need you to be able to evidence the fact that those contributions are definitely being delivered to the project. And can I also ask, um, regarding the, um, you know, the implementation of the program and everything, for somebody like an organisation who has already received European funds, um, I mean, like, there is a general uh, 
agreement that you know you can't access another one but in a partnership approach if the we, we don't we don't have such requirement but what don't. we no we don't so you can apply so long as we know that it is a distinct project yes. which we know that there's no duplication of funding or confusion as to what's being done by whom mm -hmm. so if it's a distinct project you will have a distinct um, sort of bank account or project budget code for this, the delivery of that particular project, and we then track the delivery. So you can be involved in more than one um, sort of service delivery, more than one fund, but so long as we can adequately track and be assured that what you're getting in terms of finance through this programme is for a distinct service and that it is auditable in terms of we can prove that you got the benefit and you expended the money completely within the terms of the letter of offer you would get from ourselves. Hi, my name is Martin Duffy from the Health and Living Centre Alliance here in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's just a, a wee quick point. The last speaker kept referring to patients uh, in his presentation, and that would almost suggest that there's going to be a huge emphasis on health service type services. But if you look at thematic object nine, it talks there about reducing uh, the number of people at risk of poverty and social exclusion. You know, I just want to be sure that there's going to be equal Sort of work well, you'll you'll profession. see you'll see within the cooperation program we do refer to beneficiaries as well. We're looking at the intervention to the individual or the family in terms of the um, vulnerable families and, and children's. So we're looking at beneficiaries now. In some cases, that may be clinical patients. In other cases, in terms of positive health promotion, you may find that it's more closely termed beneficiary. I'm not for the purpose of today I'm not making a distinction and we may have interchanged terminology so apologies for that if we have done but we're looking at who needs to access a form of service a form of care and how do we track that the intervention of that and that the fact that it's made a positive impact as we go forwards so we're going to um, now focus in on the practicalities we've given you a sense of what uh, the opportunities are that are available within the program and now we're going to look at the practicalities in terms of well, what is actually involved in making an application um, and what would I need to provide by way of information to be able to explain my project in sufficient enough detail that the steering committee could form a view on it, um, either positively or negatively. Um, and Brenda's going to take you through that. So I'm just going to hand straight over to Brenda here and she'll talk you through. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, good morning, I think still. It's still morning time. So, as Lorraine has said, my name is Brenda Hegarty and I'm Programme Manager with the Special EU Programmes Body. Um, I've been there many a year. I primarily have focused in the past in relation to the Peace Programme, but this time around I am taking responsibility for two areas of the Interreg Programme, notably the health theme and SMEs. So, I look forward to working with you as we progress our way through the process over the next number of years. I suppose health, like many of you, is very important to us, but for myself, I was born in a small village in the east of Donegal, Pedigal, which is actually on the border. I got married and I moved parishes, but I moved jurisdiction because I went then into West Tyrone. But what both of those areas have in common is the peripherality and the needs of the rural communities and certainly the messages that are coming through the CP this morning and the messages from our colleagues in the department are very relevant. The need to improve outcomes for people in rural areas, address some of the health inequalities and I look forward to receiving the applications and working with you to achieve, achieve those aspirations. As Lorraine has alluded to, I'm going to bring you through the application process. It can be slightly heavy going. Um, some of you will have previous experience with um, this programs in the past, so there are some changes and I'll bring you through that. For those of you that are new to the process, I hope I can give you a flavour and an introduction of what will be involved in terms of the application process. So this morning we are going to look at the selection process, look at the criteria that has been agreed by the Commission and the Member States. We're going to look at the application form 
and then some information around stage two application if you're lucky enough to progress to that stage. And I suppose the overall objective that has been stressed this morning is that we want to fund the best projects that will deliver on the outputs that are agreed with the Commission so that we can maximise the impact of the health budget in this rural areas. So the first slide that you'll see there is a good illustration of the two-stage process that will now be evident in all of our programmes going forward. This is a change from the previous program when there would have been just one overall application process. So it allows for applicants not to invest significant time and energy at the beginning of the process and then devote their energies when there is confirmation that you're in line with the outputs and the expectation of the program, then much more detail is brought out in stage two. So stage one there, as you can see, is a succinct process which will last eight weeks. We hope to open the call, and I'll go through the time skills at the end of the presentation, but we open the call now on the 2nd of October. Stage two then, you will be invited, successful applicants under stage one is invited to submit a business plan. We're allowing a six week process for the submission of the business plan and then a 22 week process for the appraisal of a stage two application. So overall, we're committing ourselves to a 36 week turnaround timetable from the opening of the call to the closing. And we'll go into more detail on that as we move forward. The first thing that will happen when we receive your stage one application will be an eligibility check. And that's basic administrative check to make sure it has been received on time. Now, unfortunately, um, although we're committed to e-cohesion, the database, which has been developed for all programs in Northern Ireland, is not yet ready. We're probably at a more advanced stage than some of the other programs. So this call and our early calls are going to be done through a paper-based system. So it'll be an application form will be made available when the call information is announced and you will submit that application by email to ourselves. So an electronic signature and an email submission is sufficient. It needs to be authorised by your accounting officer or CEO. Obviously, it must be completed in full. It must benefit the eligible region and it must be eligible activities. So those are the basic administrative check that we will complete. If that is the case, then you will proceed and we will appraise your application. In the event that it doesn't meet the criteria, we will give you an opportunity to withdraw the application or we will bring it straight through to steering committee. No further appraisal will be done on that application and it'll be recommended for a rejection. So the scoring and selection criteria has been agreed with the Commission and the Member States and that's illustrated in your slide. There is major complementarity between the selection criteria in Stage 1 and Stage 2 with two additional criteria identified under Stage 2. So in Stage 1 there is five criteria, notably the fit with the results and outputs of the programme the quality of your project design, the cross-border cooperation, governance, and value for money. And then in the second stage, that sections will be reappraised to gallow with two further ones, which is the cross-cutting themes of equality and sustainable development. So that's a good overview of how we will assess. Just in relation to the scoring, and more detail is available on our website, but we score the applications, each criteria, on a score of not to five. Successful applicants must achieve a threshold of 60%, but also they need to achieve a criteria, a minimum score in all of the criteria of three. So just be careful when you're balancing and presenting your stage one application that due regard is given to all the criteria and not overly weighted because you could fall down at that stage. Obviously, um, we need to emphasize that 
If you are successful at stage one and you're invited to complete and submit an application through the form of a business plan in stage two, that it is no guarantee of success. You will be reappraised and a much detailed appraisal will be done at that stage. I want to take the opportunity now to bring you through each of those criteria just a wee bit more in depth to identify what we will be considering in the appraisal process. So what you've heard this morning's message is this major emphasis on the outputs of the programme. The outputs is fixed. That is what we have agreed with the Commission that we will deliver in this region. There will be a penalty for our non-deliverance, if that is the case. So therefore, unlike the previous programmes where applications could be presented that was activity-based and in general keeping with the programme, this time only applications that can demonstrate that they deliver against the outputs will be successful. So it's very important that you consider the outputs within the defined area that you wish to apply to and illustrate how you meet that criteria. An application can be submitted under each of the defined area or strategic applications can be submitted, but we are considering, it'll be detailed in the call, but I personally believe that in order to get the detail of your application and the sense of your application, then an individual application under the defined area will be necessary. The call will identify any scale or the minimum scale of the project that we are requesting, so just be mindful when you read the call information that there may be sub-criteria identified under the results and outputs that you will need to pay attention to. I suppose the cornerstone of your project is your project design, and this is really um, illustrating to us how you have constructed your project, so the quality of the project design in the pre-planning, design, and implementation of your project. So we were looking at things at innovation and how creative and new is this model that you are presented. The capacity to mainstream, as John has alluded to this morning, the need that we don't leave patients hanging in 2020, that there is an opportunity to embed your activity into the provision. Um, looking at the additionality and how you add value and complement the current provision within the sectors. The ability to provide mobility of healthcare workers and professionals and patients across the border to include the development of the necessary protocols and just that criteria there that any trials that will be funded will have to demonstrate the evidence of a market failure. So that's just some of the issues that you will need to be considerate of when presenting your proposal. Obviously, the quality of your project design will be assessed against the efficiency and effectiveness and the coherence that your project is presenting. This slide then encompasses all of the remaining criteria, and as I said, three to five are relevant only in stage one. So then looking at your project team and the implementation arrangements, have you the right team? What is your previous experience in terms of delivery, relevance to the market that you wish to deliver the services for, the connections you've made and the collaborations and the consultation obviously will come into play. In terms of value for money, it'll be a major feature. Uh, along with all of the other aspects. And it's looking at the quality of your outputs and the return on the investment for the inputs, the outputs to be achieved and the return on the investment. So very much, we will go through the application form and some more detail on the type of information that you will provide around the financial aspects of your project. The quality of the cross-border cooperation is fundamental. It has to be relevant and it has to feature in all projects. As Lorraine has alluded to, there, we prefer projects that will span the entire eligible region, but at the minimum they have to be either North-South or Scotland-Ireland as a feature of the project. 
And then following that, in stage two, we will take more consideration of sustainable development and equality. So overall then, the type of projects that are going to be supported is a combination of that key criteria, where they have focused in on the results and outputs of the programme as identified in the call, that there is clear demonstrable cross-border activity, ignore the cross-community dimension, I don't want to scare you at this stage, that's a peace programme, but because there is a consistency and approach across the both programmes, the only distinction in the peace programme will be the cross-community cooperation, but that's not required in this programme. Obviously, and we will go into talk in more detail, the project partners, the ability of the lead partner to demonstrate good governance, financial capacity, to be able to receive a letter of offer which will be of a significant scale. The quality of the project design, value for money, and sustainable development and equality. So all of those aspects will be encompassed in a successful project. So then in terms of the application form that you will be faced with um, on the 2nd of October, as in your packs, as Elena, or Lorraine has alluded to, is a sample application form. So the questions are generic across all themes, so the only distinction will be the front page, which is relevant to the SME call, but all other sections will be similar. So I want to take this up opportunity to bring you through the five sections of the application form. So the first section, stage section A, is looking at how the project fits with the programme. So primarily this is a tick box exercise. The outputs for the programme will be specified and you will tick the relevant ones that is of consideration to yourself. A2 then looks at project location. We are seeking applications that are obviously um, located across the eligible area. As Lorraine has said, Belfast is now included. But the programme does provide for opportunities for projects to be located outside of the region, if that's relevant and appropriate. And the conditions by which they can be supported would be that if those applications and projects will benefit the area, the eligible area, so you could be located outside but beneficial to the eligible area. And also we have to be mindful of a 20% restriction at a programme level. So not more than 20% of the projects will be located outside the area. Now in the previous programmes we didn't even come near that barrier but it is a barrier and a threshold that has been set by the Commission. So then on to section two, and this is an opportunity for you to illustrate how your project contributes to the outputs and results as defined. Lorraine has went through the different defined areas and what the outputs are under each of those. So you will have to identify in quantifiable terms how your project is meeting the output. So it's around beneficiaries and patients, what is the basis of your project and how you will contribute to the defined outputs and results. In terms then of the project design, um, we wish to fund very well designed high quality projects that is going to deliver the outputs and make the impact and the transformative change in the region. You need to consider how your project will deliver against the criteria that we are seeking to achieve. We need the detail on the clear objectives with the intended change in mind, how you're going to reach your beneficiaries, what level of engagement you may have undertaken with them at this stage, any specific actions and activities that you will engage in, and any additional sub-criteria that may be necessary and defined in the call, you need to be cognizant of that when completing that section of your application form. I should also draw your attention that there is a 5,000 character limit, so they are quite a small application form, so um, just to be succinct and relevant and focused on the criteria and the question being asked in that section. 
B3 then looks at the quality of the cross-border cooperation. So it's looking, as we have said, there is two elements essential, but the other two, one of the other two needs to be achieved, and if possible, we would desire for all four to be met in your application. So joint development, implementation, staffing, and financing. Look at and try and articulate the benefits that you are going to bring through your project to the cross-border dimension. Why is the cross-border dimension relevant and appropriate and adding value to the initiative that you are proposing? And that is your opportunity under section B3. In terms then of the actual project team and the implementation arrangements, um, this is really looking at the lead partner structure and the partners involved in the project. Are the right people around the table? Are they a cohesive partnership? Is there opportunities or is there gaps in the partners, perhaps across the geographical spread or in the sector that you are targeting? So just be mindful of that, that you have brought the right people. Is there evidence of working in the past? Maybe you have evidence of managing partnerships and projects of a European project in the past and the mix of experience and expertise that you're bringing to bear. Part C then is actually a breakdown by box, giving you an opportunity to detail individual partners in your project. There is room for the lead partner and I think four other partners in the boxes. So really you'll be looking at naming the organizations, looking at the organization structure, their legal basis for being, looking at governing documents and financial and governance arrangements, and what are the organization's relevant competencies and experience that they're bringing to bear on this project? So really what we're teasing out there is the pro people that's coming around the table to deliver the project. As it says there, it's really those partners that have budgetary responsibility that we are most concerned with in that section. Okay, then part D then looks at the financial and the money situation is always very important and I want to bring you over through in the next few slides the level of detail and some of the changes that is going to happen in the new program um, in relation to budgetary management. So really what we will be looking at in this section is what is the financial governance and management arrangements that you are bringing to bear on this project. Obviously, EU regulations require significant financial governance and we need to be satisfied that the lead partner and indeed the budgetary partners have the competency and experience to deliver out on the project. You have to identify your cash flow arrangements, how you will cash flow and cash manage the project during its entirety. Identify any match funding or in-kind arrangements that you may be bringing to bear. And identify any major procurement exercises that will feature as part of your project proposal. There will be an opportunity to provide a breakdown of individual costs and we'll go through the cost headings that will be relevant and appropriate and also then an opportunity to look at the sustainability of your project and how it is going to be mainstreamed beyond the lifetime of this intervention. So just then, in terms of more details on the project budget, you will be asked to present your costs against six budget categories. Now, not all categories will be relevant to you, so you'll need to identify, but it is only in that form will we accept the presentation of costs. So you will detail the actual costs that you anticipate that it will take to deliver out on the project outputs. The lead partner will have flexibility between budget lines and as well as doing it as a collective, there will be an opportunity to present it for each individual project partner. One of the key changes in the new programs is simplified costs. So the Commission have identified a number of opportunities for simplification. 
in the past, if any of you are aware of EU funding, will know that there has been a major focus on verification and verification of actual costs in order to be audit compliant. That has, in some cases, changed the focus away from the outputs and the achievement of the results and maybe an overemphasis on the financial input costs. So one of the opportunities that we are progressing with under simplification will be the unit cost approach. They will be used in this theme, so all letters of offer we will be issuing with a unit cost calculation. They will be established and agreed with the successful applicants at stage two. But in stage one, you will be invited to present, if relevant and if you have the information, on your unit cost approach. Obviously, they will be tested at a much more rigorous stage during stage two. Uh, we will be benchmarking your proposal against our own historical data. And we will be looking for evidence back by three years of evidence in order to establish the unit costs. So the stage one will bring you, give you an introduction to that, and it will be much more robust, robustly tested during stage two. Indirect costs, which are your overheads, should not be included in the calculation of your unit costs. A flat rate of up to 15% will be available against staff costs in respect of your indirect costs. So um, the objective will be that you will be established with a unit cost plus a flat rate of 15% of your staff costs. So that's the financial and administration arrangements that will be in place. Obviously, direct salary costs are relevant to staff directly engaged in the delivery of your project. For example, the project coordinator and your administrative staff. Other staff costs like HR, financial, may be indirect costs. So just be careful when you are distinguishing between your direct staff costs and your indirect staff costs. But the important message is particular attention must be paid to your budget construction because that will be the basis of your value for money assessment but most importantly if successful it will be the basis by which we will contract you to deliver out on your project outputs. There will be no opportunity to come back to us and say we miscalculated, costs have changed, whatever. Once they are fixed and established there will be no change throughout the lifetime of the program. So it, it does pay your attention to be very mindful at stage one even, because what we don't want to see as you move between stage one and stage two is a major change in costs. That would give us some area of concern. So you would need, I suppose one of the positive things of having your workshop at this stage before the call opens is the opportunity to reflect now on the type of project, if this program is relevant and appropriate to you, and start constructing your project in terms of the outputs and the cost basis that will be involved. Yes, that's a great point. Okay, your application doesn't need to be in euros, but your letter of offer will be in euros. So there will be an agreed if you can either submit your application in euros, if you so desire, or in the currency of your choice, but we will then apply if you are successful, a exchange rate and that you will receive your letter of offer in euros. So the key issues then is illustrated in this slide. So looking at how you complement and add value in the strategic fit with the policy objectives of our departmental colleagues has been well communicated and documented this morning. Is your project content appropriate, relevant and deliverable and is it in line with the outputs that we wish to achieve? Have you a delivery plan? Is it robust and deliverable? 
Will you be able to achieve the outputs? Do you have a structure and a project plan in place that gives us, the appraisal team, and indeed the steering committee, the confidence that this project will meet the objectives and the outputs set? How is your initiative's target under health and social care? And as I alluded to, are the right partners around the table? Is there any obvious gaps that will be a major flaw in your project? So that was a whistle-stop tour, perhaps, on stage one application form. Um, I just want to take a quick look at stage two. Now, it may be relevant to some and not others, so I'm not going to overemphasize stage two at this stage. We probably will commit to a further workshop down the line with successful stage one applicants, if they deem it appropriate and relevant, to bring them through the business plan guidance. But basically, stage two will now focus on a business plan. It is not, um, like in the past, an individual application form. We are seeking a business plan for all projects that are successfully progressed through stage two. We are asking that that business plan is submitted within six weeks of receiving a successful letter in stage one. So the timeline for the submission is very challenging. And that means that you should be really constructing your business plan at this stage, which should then inform your stage one and a natural flow into stage two. It'll be very difficult to complete out your stage one application in the absence of a reasonably advanced business plan at this stage. So certainly I would encourage you to start working on that. In your packs, you have the business plan guidance. So there is very detailed guidance on what is the content that we are required in stage one, or sorry, stage two. The other thing I'd like to emphasize from stage one into stage two is that there will be no automatic transfer of scores. So just because you scored and featured well in stage one under certain criteria, the board is wiped clean and we start afresh. It is on the basis of the standalone project and your business plan that is presented. There is an opportunity to seek an extension of the six week window for the business plan submission if required. The only thing will be that we have to draw to your attention is that everybody else moves forward. We will not stop the process to wait on the slowest person. So in the event that you are not able to deliver out on your business plan within the window afforded, we will be progressing with the projects that are submitted and they will be presented to a fixed steering committee, which you will see is scheduled in advance. So, you know, you run the risk by not meeting the indicative timelines of perhaps the budgets being allocated in advance of your submission. So in terms then of the business plan requirements, they're quite standard. Any of you have previous experience in the business plan. Obviously the executive summary, which is the summary of all the key parts in the business plan. We're also then looking at detailed analysis of your project, the need and demand, the financial arrangements, your governance arrangements, and your exit strategy, to name but a few. I'll go through just a few of the critical ones um, and emphasize those again. The fundamentals of your success will be based on how you construct your project. So what is the basic idea? How are you going to target in the outputs and the results? And that needs to be clearly articulated. And if you can't get the concept of your project down on one or two pages, then there's major concern. So it is about being able to articulate and transfer the knowledge of your project discreetly and succinctly within the business plan guidance. What are your critical success factors? What are the risks? Who have you engaged? What is the evidence that this type of project construction is the right and most appropriate project for the achievement of the outputs? One of the fundamentals, and that will be tested further under the appraisal process that we will go through in the business plan, which we will look at a combination, in some instances, an economic appraisal will be relevant and appropriate, but not all instances. 
um, we would consider it appropriate where, for example, the scale of the project may be above five million pounds. But uh, we will be engaging technical advisors and advice from the department colleagues. But one of the fundamental issues in the past has been evidence of need. You need to be able to illustrate that as well as constructing the best project, it is constructed on the basis that it is needed by the project, the community that you're trying to target. How have you evidenced that need? And that will be a key component for the success. You're looking, and they've been well articulated in the cooperation program, which you have been urged to read this morning. It is very important that the issues, the issues facing this region around health inequalities, peripherality and rurality are dealt with as a need to the construct of your project. The governance arrangements, and I would ask you draw attention to the lead partner roles and responsibilities within the programme rules. There is significant responsibility on the lead partner for receiving and accepting the letter of offer, for ensuring that there's a partnership agreement in place, ensuring that all partners deliver their project against the outputs that are required, against the agreed budgets, and in accordance with regulations. There will be a requirement that in the event that there is irregularities, that that financial burden in the first instance rests with the lead partner. So there is certain financial and governance arrangements that are required to be demonstrated for a project to become a lead partner. So familiarize yourself with that and be confident that the lead partner that is selected for your project is the best and right lead partner for your project delivery. Correct. There will be a stage two assessment as part of the assessment of your business plan. There will be an assessment of the financial and governance arrangement of the lead partner. So you will be invited in part of your business plan to submit evidence of your financial standing of the lead partner. And that will provide a basis by which judgments will be made on the capacity of the lead partner to be in compliance with the programme expectations. Looking then around the skills and experiences of the partners, the staffing plan that you will be putting into place, the mobility plan, because one of our major challenges in the previous programmes has been the long lead-in time in getting projects on the ground. We certainly will not be absorbing that loss in the future programmes, so we will be asking projects to get a mobility plan in place within six months of receiving a letter of offer so that you have a clear plan of staffing engaged and activity on the ground ready to progress your project. Um, so that's very important and you need to ensure that that's well documented. Viability, we have dealt with um, that in the previous, but as I have alluded to, there will be a test in relation to the viability and the governance arrangements of the lead partner to ensure that the correct people are selected for the delivery of our project. Finances, as I have mentioned earlier, are very, very important. Much more important in this section than in previous sections because um, of the, our ability, inability to reassess the cost basis of your project. So you need to be confident up front that you have the cost structure and the budgets presented in the most correct way. So you're looking at it from two points of view, one being the long-term delivery of your project, but also being confident that it stands out to value for money. Is the outputs that you are proposing in your application justifiable for the cost structure that it is required for delivery. So it's about keeping them as efficient and as lean as possible, but not overly reducing them so that you leave it very difficult for you and your partners to deliver out on the project. We are looking at the objectives of being innovative, looking at opportunities to introduce more value for money within the healthcare sector. So looking for those efficiencies in the budget construct will be very important. 
And the final slide then for yourselves um, on this section is looking at the time scale around the programme. So stage one, we are planning to open this call on the 2nd of October. Now the content and any sub-criteria is still under discussion, but it's more or less in line with what is in the CP. We close the call on the 13th of November, so I think it'll be 12 o'clock on the 13th of November, which unfortunately for some is a Friday, but I hope that's not going to impact negatively on your success. And then we're planning to bring that to steering committee in the 8th of January. So certainly there'll be a busy time over the Christmas period getting the projects appraised and ready for steering committee on the 8th of January. Stage two then, projects will be invited, notified very shortly after the 8th of January. I would imagine within two or three days you'll be notified of the success of your project at that stage. You'll be invited to submit a business plan within six weeks of that correspondence with a view to receive your business plan and get it appraised and ready for our steering committee, which is scheduled for the 22nd of July, 2015. So realistically speaking, successful projects will be in receipt of a letter of offer by the end of July, early August 2016. So it's a challenging time scale. We would appreciate your cooperation, particularly around stage two submission of the business plan in order to meet those objectives, because it's very important that the beneficiaries and the community can benefit at the earliest opportunity from the funding that is made available under the programme. Just want to, one final thing is to allude to the budgets. They are still being um, finalised within the arrangements, but they will be detailed in the call. At the moment, each of the defined areas, which you have identified earlier this morning, there's six defined areas around population, health, disability, children's services, so on. There is an indicative budget of around eight to 11 million against each of those defined areas. But that will become apparent in the call. So if you take some attention off the call, as Lorraine has said, we're happy to um, discuss projects or outlines of projects with Caroline, who is our national contact point, or any points of clarity you want to raise with me or anybody in the SEUPB, we're happy to consider those. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope that has given you a flavour of the programme application and selection. Respect to the application process and requirements. Hi, um, I just wanted to, just two quick questions please. Um, in terms of the numbers of partners, I see within the application form there's space for four partners I think. Is there a limit as to the minimum or maximum numbers of partners that a project should have? Um, my second question would be, is there any appeal um, process for either stage one or stage two? Yes, thank you for your questions and I had a wee note to mention refuse so I've completely forgot it. But in relation to your first part, first question, there is no restrictions on the number of partners. The only thing we would flag up is obviously the larger the partnership, the more unwieldy. So it should be relevant and appropriate to the scale and aspect of the project that you wish to present. Um, if in the event you can present the information on the four project partners, the detail in the stage one application form and indeed the lead partner and then make reference that if there is other projects there's an opportunity to list them on the application form. In relation to the review process under stage one there is an independent review panel established for the programmes and that's chaired then by our chief executive with independent panel members and they review the outcome of the decision, whether it was reasonable and whether due process has been followed. In stage one, that review process is going to be by written procedure, so any unsuccessful applicants at stage one will be given an opportunity to seek a review by written correspondence. And under stage two, then, if you progress to business plan and you are unsuccessful, there is an opportunity, but that will be done by way of a panel and a presentation at the panel. So there is an opportunity for a review. Um, 
Sorry, just uh, I suppose the other comment I would make, just in respect to that, um, just also to be aware that from our perspective, um, with myself and Brenda and the team, that any applications that are not successful, you will also get feedback. So, you know, it's not a case that you won't ever know what happened. We will give feedback in terms of where your application fell down against the criteria and the reasons why it was not successful. Here, Louise. Can you submit an application to more than one category, the same application to more than one category? No. <laughs> I'm just thinking it's I'm thinking broad, here. No. Some of the there is defined areas. So you will have to identify how your project delivers against the outputs in that defined area. Now, um, if you are constructing perhaps an application that spans more than one defined area, um, that we, is probably. We, yeah. I, I, we will consider and reflect on that as part of our requirements under the call. But certainly, I had not envisaged applicants spanning more than one of the defined area. Hi, um, just a quick question really. Uh, on the 2nd of October, will all the outputs open for applications across the defined areas? At the moment, that is subject to negotiation and we're meeting with the departments this afternoon. So certainly we are looking at the opportunity to open all of the areas at this stage. So we, we, that will become apparent in the call. If not all, then the majority of the areas will open on the first call and there will be a further call within four to six months of the first call. So if all areas are not included in the first call, we will go out in the springtime for the remaining call. There may be subsequent calls later on uh, in the years if we find that the first batch of applications have not met all of the outputs and um, that we required under the programme. Is there an indicative budget for projects? That will be defined in the call. So the scale of the project will be identified. At the moment, it's subject to negotiation. But we are considering a more strategic approach is preferred. So we will not have significant volume of small scale projects. But the actual scale by which a project will have to be will be defined in the call. In terms of uh, communicating when the call opens, we will email everyone who is attended here today when the call opens. But also please check our website regularly and also follow us on Twitter because we'll have updates in terms of the funding calls on Twitter as well. Brenda, can I just ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Teresa. Um, just in terms of the length of projects, do you have a specific um, period of time in mind? Um, should uh, projects be of three years, five years? Seven years? Or yeah. The programme allows a project to be of seven years duration. Now, by the time your project is successful, if successful, and receive a letter of offer, there would only be an opportunity for a six-year duration. But any project that is above, a th beyond a three-year duration, there will be a break clause <coughs> in the letter of offer, which will give us an opportunity, and indeed yourself, to reflect on the success of the project and then to progress in. So it can be of any duration up to six years with a break clause. I think the other aspect, just in terms of the duration of your project as well, is that if you are looking for a longer term project, whatever the number of years is that you identify within your project application, we just ask you to explain why you need the length of time that you need to deliver out the range of outputs. So it's just to explain, you know, if it's a three year project, why is it three? If it's five, why do you need the full five years to deliver out on that? and that just we have a clear understanding when we present to the steering committee. 